and start uh, our panel. Uh, hello, everybody, uh, dear friends, colleagues uh, all around the world and also from Turkey. Uh, I would like to uh, give a big welcome to you all on behalf of Turkish Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. So we will be having this panel uh, with great dentists, as you see, uh, really passionate dentists. Uh, and uh, we will be discussing uh, COVID-19. Uh, as we named this panel, uh, the panel, uh, we will try to get a, a global approach. Uh, and now it's been like all around the world, uh, it's been like two months that uh, we close our uh, practices and we are all at home. I hope uh, you're all uh, healthy and uh, trying to stay motivated. Uh, unfortunately, we can only see emergency cases, but COVID is going to stay here, so we have to adapt to this. Uh, and we have to start uh, practicing. And uh, probably most of you like me getting phone calls from your patients. Uh, some have anxiety, some have pain, some have other dental issues. So uh, anyway, in a shorter time period, we have to go back and we have to gain our confidence back uh, to start with uh, safety precautions and uh, clear guidelines. Uh, and probably we have to switch the protocols in our clinics and adapt our patients, our staff, uh, and the way we practice uh, in our clinics. So at the end of the day, safety is, uh, the feeling of safety is what we need uh, overall. So uh, Dr. Park, Dr. Stanley, and Dr. Trosch, thank you very much uh, for attending our panel. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, today we will be discussing a little bit about biosafety and let me introduce you our participants. Uh, Dr. Markus Troll, she's from Germany uh, and he has dual uh, degree. He has both MD and uh, DMD and he has been practicing uh, in, his uh, in his clinic uh, concentrated on maxillofacial surgery. Uh, implants and aesthetic dentistry for the last 20 years and uh, I know Marcus you know the Turkish community knows you very well because you were our main speaker uh, at the international meeting the 20th one uh, so it's very nice and honor for us to uh, have you again and uh, Marcus is really so generous about his knowledge so uh, and he's beside being a great practitioner he's also uh, he has great passion on education okay so uh, dr kwan boom park let me introduce you a little bit uh, to our attendees uh, dr park is from south korea and he's ceo of uh, megagen implant company uh, and also the director of uh, mir dental clinics uh, it's a dso organization uh, and Dr. Park, we were really inspired so much and uh, encouraged uh, with the video you featured in the beginning of April. So uh, I'm really so excited to have you here and uh, hope to hear more about your protocols that you applied uh, since that day. Okay, and my third guest, uh, the last but not the least, uh, Dr. Miguel Stani, he is from Portugal, probably you also know him. Uh, he's a great practitioner, he's an oral surgeon, and he has his own dental uh, private practice in Lisbon. So, uh, and Miguel is, again, a very passionate uh, dentist. We know his uh, concepts, slow dentistry, and also no half smiles philosophy. So... Miguel, thank you very much for joining us uh, and I hope you will have a chance to talk a little bit more uh, about uh, your protocols. We would love to hear your knowledge uh, and all the protocols that you applied. So, Marcus, should we start? Uh, I guess you're going to make a presentation uh, to make up a summary of the evidence, okay? <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for being invited. It's a huge honor to be with you guys again. The experiences at EDAT will always be in the center of my heart as this is one of the greatest meetings and the greatest groups I've ever had the pleasure to be with. So I'm really, really happy we can share some time. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I compilated a little bit of the data and I hope this helps you a little bit as work has really been flooding me in the last, well, let's say four weeks. Um, 
I am very happy that I have actually some industry support for my webinars at the moment. It's Bego and Geistlich who support me these days for these webinars. Uh, so the panel you accumulated, Kubel, is amazing. There's, uh, with Professor Park, we have one of the most famous guys, both in dentistry and in implant surgery here. And Miguel is like the rock star dentist we have. He's the only one who was ever featured in National Geographic. Uh, that's like one of the biggest things and I'll mention that later also he founded a, a basically it's a movement a philosophy of practicing it's called slow dentistry and we'll see in the course of this presentation how valuable uh, slow dentistry actually is in what is happening right now so we're talking about the effect co corona the coronavirus has on dentistry and for this we have to go a little bit into the data first to the left that's my brother Matthias to write, that's me. Uh, we do all that together. That's our office at home. It's a family office. It's been operational since 75 years now. To the right is my dad, who's still working with us. And usually our main fields of research are bone and tissue augmentation and implant surgery and uh, sinus therapy and uh, jawbone pathology. So we're not viro virologists. We basically came there from a practical approach. So the pro approach that you all have also in your offices while facing an epidemic of a scale that we haven't encountered in a hundred years, uh, not really knowing what to do with that. So that's where our research came from. Before we go into the details, let me do some uh, just details, we, we, some, some facts we need to clarify. Like what are we talking about? The virus SARS-CoV-2, the disease, it's called COVID-19, and corona, which is basically the nickname for the whole thing, right? So when we say corona, we mean the disease, the virus, everything at the same time. Now for viruses, it's, it's important to understand that transmission is not infection. So once that virus hits you, this doesn't mean you get sick. It has to hit areas that are susceptible for that. And furthermore, and this gets specifically interesting for us, we have to differentiate for viruses that can sort of be transferred by people standing next to each other if it's a droplet transmission, so you need bigger drops of water containing quite a number of viruses. Or if an airborne transmission, that's what we in our saying sometimes mean by aerosol, but it's not in the scientific way. So the airborne transmission, that would be viruses floating around our dental operatories. That would be uh, a transmission via air conditioning, uh, if that is possible too. And these two have, been different, have to be differentiated very, very much. Um, Furthermore, we need to understand that viruses need a certain amount uh, that have to be transmitted to cause the disease at the end. So viruses don't live, right? They're just particles. That's why we can kill them. We can deactivate them. And as you can see in this study, this is about influenza, but there are some similarities between these viruses, we'll be coming, to, coming down to that, that show that it's both dose dependent, how the, actually the disease goes off, and also if an infection can take place at all. Furthermore, viruses mutate. And for SARS-CoV-2, already the first mutations have been found. So if we want to, I'll have small sum, uh, summaries in between, right? And Hubel, if you have anything uh, like questions that are alluded to that, just feel free to go whenever you want, right? And I'll have little breaks like these summaries where we can easily talk about things. Okay, it's going quite well. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, wonderful. My, my transmission is okay, my internet? Excuse me? Internet is okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So we have to understand <clears throat> that we as dentists, we will be transmitted that virus, but that means we're not being infected. That's to differentiate. And viruses mutate, so even when there's a vaccination, this doesn't mean total security. What do we know about that virus? We know it's an infectious disease that's transmitted through droplets, so the big ones, not the tiny floaty ones. And we know that it has to attach to um, mucosa area, especially larynx and nasal, maybe also eyes. So this means this setup for working is just not enough, as my eyes are not protected. There is no hard data out there that demonstrates that it can actually enter through the eyes, but we think it can. 
So that's why we need to protect our eyes. That's from Wikipedia. Probably everybody knows that illustration, right? And the family of coronaviruses is very old, known. It's known for approximately 100 years in animals and since the 1960s in humans. And on the left, you can see how many coronaviruses there are. So it's an RNA virus, and the virus we're facing, the SARS-CoV-2, is a beta coronavirus just right here in the middle. So it's important to understand we're not facing a very new superbug that has never been appeared before. We are facing a virus of a well-known and well-researched family that has developed a, an aggressive strain and leads to a very serious disease. It's important for me to state that several times so that I'm not misunderstood. I'm not underestimating that disease. I am taking this extremely seriously, but it's not the super killer that we sometimes see in the media, right? There is evidence that it is actually in the air and on surfaces around. This is an amazing study uh, from a Wuhan uh, uh, hospital where you can see that around the, the COVID-19 severely infected patients in the ICU, there is positive samples in air and surfaces. However, this study didn't show whether these are infectious or not, uh, just that they're there and we have to protect us. Furthermore, this study demonstrated that our protective gear works well because none of the doctors working there or, or, and the nurses, although there's lots of viruses around them, got infected. Now, the WHO, that's a very important thing, states that an airborne transmission, so what we talk about in dentistry as aerosols, the little floaty droplets, right, is not reported in 75,000 cases. And I'll be stressing on that several times more. We don't have proof that it's not possible to be transmitted by that. That's very important to know. But all the hints we have link to that, that it's a droplet transmitted infection. So by me spitting at somebody while talking and sneezing, but it's probably not working airborne. Furthermore, it's important to know that the normal disinfectants we use in the dental office that we have been using for the last 10 to 15 years work absolutely fine on this virus. Furthermore, that also hydrogen peroxide and hypochlorite work. So that's a very important thing here. Um, in our office, we use 1% hydrogen peroxide for one minute rinsing prior to any procedure because we know that deactivates the virus sufficiently. Furthermore, there is evidence that just by opening the windows of your operatories, you get enough fresh air to actually vent that virus out. This data, as you can see, go, see here, goes back to 1934, right? So it's a very, very old data. There is, as this studies uh, show, there's little evidence that ventilation directly reduces the risk. However, there's lots of evidence that no ventilation increases the risk. So whenever you have the option to get fresh air in your office, do so, and that will actually help. So it enters through the mucosa, maybe eyes also. Our normal disinfection and sterilization protocols that we have been applying for 20 years are absolutely e efficient. And it's definitely the droplets that transmit the virus. We are not sure about airborne transmission, probably not. What is it about dental spray? And I will stress on that furthermore as well, because very often in the media and when dentists are talking, you hear, oh, we are producing aerosols. But that is not true. When we are working, we produce water spray. And with that water spray, saliva and particles that are in the oral cavity can become a part of the total spray and thus form an aerosol. However, what comes off our hand pieces, and I'll show you that in a minute, is first and all, water spray. There is good evidence actually that um, there is sort of bugs in that dental spray around us, in that splatter. Well, that uh, study is from 2004 and the first SARS virus was, was already researched here. We know it's there, but they didn't find any infectious potential in this. Now it's important that we can see that our suction techniques that we apply in dentistry are efficient to reduce the dental spray a lot. And what is a lot? 90%. And we did some research on that and we worked and those two amazing gentlemen, you probably know them, inspired us a lot to think further in this. So we had a special camera set up in our office and I'm very glad that this is brand new. It has been demonstrated once, so I'm happy to show you guys. 
This, this is a red handpiece as we use to prep in the dental office, right? And now I just put it on and this is the water spray that comes up. From the height of that water spray, we were measuring that for this experiment, we're close to a meter, up to 80 centimeters and a little bit above. And you see how long those droplets take to rinse down. And of course, there are smaller droplets produced by the water spray hitting the fast turning, spinning turbine, right? And these you can't see. Now what happens, same setting, if we put on water spray again, and now we approach that with a suction after we stop the water. And you can see how those droplets are sucked into the suction, but up on the right, where there's no suction, there's still droplets draining out. And it's important to see how efficient our suction is, but only if applied correctly. So now suction is on and you see the droplets are being pulled into it, further even more the closer you get to that suction device and all of a sudden the whole spray is reduced from 80 centimeters to something like 10 to 15 but it's still there but now it's important as soon as i cut the water the droplets are gone nothing's rising down so efficient suction reduces the dental spray we're producing significantly for our everyday use and if we look into the high speed single pictures, right, you see the spray, you see the droplets, you see how the suction reduces them, but it can only work efficiently right at the tip. That's why a good, especially forehand suction technique is so important. And we closer they get, first the small drops, then the big drops are being sucked in. Now this is the real life experiment. You can see how sharp that spray is that comes from the handpiece with the suction on and this is without suction and we, we had to redo that several times because the camera got so wet doing that and we were wearing shields with indicator papers while the suction was not active all the indicators uh, alerted and said humidity is coming when it was active and you can see the direct comparison here nothing came to the shields so efficient suction helps now what about surgery professor park is one of the most renowned implant surgeons in the world so this is a surgery setting that we do now this is me placing implants and of course you know who my sponsors are for this bego and geistlich and uh, this is just a surgery handpiece now you see the difference right this is still the drops it goes up about 20 centimeters only one fourth of what happens with the red handpiece droplets are gone in, a, in an instant and why is that it is the same water setting to the engine, but the reduced speed of the drill reduces the spray that is just generated and the aerosols that are generated with it. So we can conclude from this that those who perform short surgeries, oral surgery, implant surgery, augmentation surgery, are on the good side of this game already when it comes to water spray. And now if we go deeper into that, like if we talk digital dentistry and digital augmentation and digital surgery and miguel is a great prophet of digitalized and highly modern uh, protocols and what is interesting is I, I love to do these right i love to do 3d printed titanium meshes for augmentation procedures and uh, you can see they work very well in all these directions and when you place it everything's fine i love guided surgery with this uh, and what you can see is that the digital supported augmentation implant protocols reduce the time we spend in the operation significantly. And thus under epidemic control circumstances, we prefer spending less time with our patient in the exposed area. Because as long as we're talking about the whole thing here, as long as we're talking sprays that we produce, we don't consider that the worst risk factor is the patient himself. So if we just chat and the patient sneezes while we do that or coughs, the whole consideration of our spray is obsolete because then he produced probably infectious aerosols with droplets flying around. And that's why we have the patients wearing face masks in our office when they come in for consultation and they only take them off if we have to approach the oral cavity. Just to make sure if they sneeze, if they speak, all those droplets are maintained with the patient and there's so much we can learn from Southeast Asia considering that those face masks are so important. 
Louisa, she's a brilliant mind. She's the photographer with me working on all this. So thanks, Louisa, for that. We were talking, Kubel, especially about the aerosols and the infectious potential, right? This is a study from April 16, so about a month ago, that stirred up a lot of anxiousness as it demonstrated that in lab settings, you can vaporize that SARS virus so, so highly that it floats in the air and stays there actively for hours and for days on surfaces. However, this is strictly a lab and experimental setting. When we look into the reality, there is first studies as well, and they also could show there's viral RNA in the air, but they could also show that none of them actually were inf not infected. So it was deactivated, it didn't work as an infective agent. This doesn't mean we don't have to take it seriously. It just means probably no airborne transmission, but droplet transmission. Which leads us to the next thought, which leads us to the idea of our protective gear, right? And this is an important study. And during the pre-talk, I already pointed that out. This came out on May 6th, and this is under Cochrane uh, Odysseus. So it's interesting, this, this uh, study reviews all the recommendations and regulations that are out there by international bodies. So it's like the FDA, the NHS, the German health authorities, all over the world they reviewed it. And which makes me personally sad is, if you look at the top right here, theme all stuff, only 76% 70, uh, of all recommendations told that dental staff or medical staff has to wear masks at all time. What are we talking here about? Masks are the single most efficient means to contain that. So why isn't that just recommended all over the world? And furthermore, down here, unsuspected COVID-19 patients, 50% of the sources recommend N95. So at the end of the day, the officials around the world didn't find any consensus, even on the small ones. The all staff has to wear masks at all times is one of the most single efficient means to reduce the cross-contamination cross uh, cross risk in the dental office. And there's lots of studies where the N95s are needed. So this is from 2009, an old study, and they already uh, foresaw that N95 will be in short supply during a pandemic. So this is like 11 years ago, right? And here they saw that N95 is not more efficient in a clinical setting. They're always more efficient in a lab setting, but not in a clinical setting for preventing influenza among healthcare workers. This is a study from 2019 that also compared N95 and normal three-layered surgical masks. And what's interesting is they especially reviewed coronaviruses before SARS-CoV-2 that we're facing here. But remember, it's still a coronavirus. It's no superbug, it's a coronavirus. And they were absolutely sure on their recommendation normal respirators work as efficient as, K as N95 or K95 in Europe, it's FFP2s and FFP3s in a clinical setting. We're not talking lab setting. And we're not talking that if we face a potentially COVID-19 patient, that then we should resort to a N95 mask just to add extra protection but we're talking everyday use for normal, healthy patients. And this is extremely important as everybody who had to wear an N95 or anything like this or an FFP2 for a prolonged time, I had to do that several times as we were operating on tuberculosis patients. This bruises your face badly after like 12 hours. And if you have to do that 24 seven for months, we don't even have to consider bloodborne viruses now becoming airborne through our procedures who enter your skin through the lesions just your masks create. So there's always consequences to what we do, and we have to consider those as well. This is the holy grail of medicine, right? This is nature. And they reviewed whether coronaviruses, especially SARS-CoV-2, can be uh, prevented by surgical masks. And this is very interesting. They first pointed out, and that's something people don't, don't see anymore, Surgical masks were not created to keep us safe. They were created to protect the patient from us. When they have an open wound, we operate on them very close so that our breath, our droplets would not contaminate the wound. However, it is found 
that a surgical face mask, we're talking three layered here, is absolutely efficient in holding back and also protecting those who wear them from coronaviruses. Bad news here, it doesn't perfectly protect against influenza viruses. So if, if, if we ever see an outbreak of a bird flu, for instance, or a swine flu, we have to resort to higher level masks. But for corona, we're probably good. Furthermore, many prof um, professionals wear these masks with valves. It's important to see that these valves do not protect the patient, as through this, your, the, your exhaled air is not filtered anymore. And there is data that N95 masks might be a health hazard by themselves. Uh, Dr. Lozada pointed that out first to me, that came from Switzerland, uh, that they said there might be lung damage by prolonged wearing of N95. And it's interesting, if we look into the downsides of our, our measurements, there's always extremely scarce literature. But there is some literature that shows that there might be lung damages if you have to wear N95 for a prolonged time. And furthermore, they show that a valve doesn't offer any benefit for those who wear them. So at the end of the day, it's probably, if we have to wear them, we have to make sure there is no valve or we have to close that valve that the patient is not in higher danger. People transmit it and our high volume suction works wonderful as, as well as our protect, protection equipment. So how do we work with that? That title that you can see here was the title of our first summary we published on the 25th of March already, uh, because we are pretty sure that this virus will be around for a very, very long time. Like HIV and hepatitis C, this will be part of our everyday business. And so we have to learn how to cope with that. So everywhere where you see that green hook, we have that on our website to download. This is our hygiene recommendations that we use in our office. And you can see there uh, on point number one, surgical masks have to be worn at all times in the clinic by all staff members. Masks may only be removed for drinking, eating, and only if no one else is in the same room or at a distance of at least two meters. I consider that the single most important factor of disease control in a medical or dental setting. Also very important, and we learned that from Southeast Asia, we do a telephone triage. We call the patients the day before they come in and check for symptoms. You can download everything like of this. And Hubel, we can probably put the links close to the replay of this, uh, of this lecture, right? That everybody has them ready at hand. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I'll send you all the links and you can just, for the convenience of everybody watching, accumulate them. So personal protection equipment, these are internet findings, right? And we consider them not necessary. And it's interesting to see how many countries find, uh, let's say, creative solutions for protection. Um, but this is uh, Steffen Ulbrich, a good friend of Miguel and mine, and he just demonstrates perfect setup. Uh, he even wears a shield. We see shields quite, um, well, double-sided, but he does it. Perfect setup, clean room, great protection, and that works absolutely fine. This is how I approach every patient in the, in the clinic. Every chat, every high, I don't run around in the clinic other than that. Full protection. If I have to pr uh, go any, for any procedure that might produce splatters, I'll cover my, my gowns with a disposable gown. And if we have to operate on a, a COVID-19 patient, we'll be in N95 face shield and full gowns because here my loops don't fit. This is how I work in a regular setting, right? My assistant forehand suction works wonderful. And um, at this point, allow me to thank all the dental staffs around the world. You make our life happier, better, you help us with our everyday tasks. And now we learned you even protect us from the diseases that come out of the patient's mouth. So our dental staffs are absolutely important for us. Room disinfection. There have been tons of discussions about that since last night. So I added that and I researched what I could find. Uh, so fogging seems to be big in some minds right now. Basically aerosol aerosolizing disinfectants. Now, I, I tried to find publications on comparison of, of disinfection with aerosols versus swipes, but you can see there's no results on that. And also fogging versus swiping, there's no results. There's some results on UV light disinfection, 
but they're mainly focused towards water disinfection. Now, what we can see is, and this is a very important study as it's a hospital uh, infection control, that they found that hydrogen peroxide gases disinfection works, but only after prior swiping down all the surfaces so that germs, not talking corona here, that all the pathogens that are in there are sort of stripped from their mucus layer. So this says it does not replace swiping down surfaces. And there's a big study on disinfection of aircraft that shows superior to swiping down surfaces. Of course, you can swipe down a whole aircraft, right? But from all the other studies that I found, it is, yes, they work, but there is no co controlled trials comparing them to swiping down or showing that if you use them, to ha you have to swipe down properly before, that manual cleaning is the essential element and then others can come in on top. Now, we know that the most problematic area of our equipment is the equipment itself. So there, there's a study on Ebola from last year, how to disinfect that personal equipment, right? And even there, they didn't find a superiority of spray versus vibe disinfection. But they also showed in this study how important it is to have a proper protocol. If you wear a space suit or something like that to work, if you don't know how to properly dispose of it, it doesn't make any sense at all. So handling the gear is most important. And again, as already stated, it's very important to know that our normal disinfectants work fine, uh, both extra and intraorally, and that ventilation helps. So when it comes to room disinfection, again, what is definitely shows here is the perfect setup. There's nothing lying around. Everything is covered. And um, thus, we can probably work with that fine. Furthermore, there's evidence that aerosolizing disinfectants is a lung hazard. There's, again, not much evidence on that, but there are some studies that show that aerosolizing disinfectants can lead to asthma and COPD. So I'm not trying to go deeply into that as there's not much data, but just keep that in the back of the, your mind. There's a downside to that as well. Additional measures, it's important if we look into mouth rinses that hydrogen, hydroxin peroxide works absolutely fine, but our chlorhexidine is less efficient in mouth rinsing against corona. So we should use hydrox, hydrogen. Um, masks that are applied correctly are very important. This is a guide we made how to apply and dispose of surgical masks in the dental office correctly. You can download that as well. And also we have the same guide for patients, how they should wear them, how they should fit them. So it works what we do. Our suction is absolutely efficient and um, our hygiene protocols, our basic hygiene protocols, if applied correctly, work fine. So to finalize this, just allow me to show what happens if we make dentists stop their work if they we reduce patients to simple emergency care and stop the regular treatments um, the medical side of dentistry basically there's lots of evidence that people who are not well equipped with teeth or press work uh, have many burdens in their life including losing weight being more prone to infections and we also have neurologic side findings like dementia and uh, falling tendencies. This is from Ronnie Yap, a good friend of mine who sent that study to me. Uh, dementia is a very important thing and we'll all summarize that in a book which is coming this year finally. So ask a quintessence representative for an English one. Um, the problem with dentistry is that we're facing the single most aggressive combination of pathogens there are in the human body. And there is several ways that can actually infect us and you know all of this and we're not going into the names of all those bacteria as they're being changed all over all over again but what we can see is that those in green can adhere to smooth surfaces like teeth or implants those in blue can actually inhibit the immune response of the body and those in red can destroy the body so if these can destroy enamel, the hardest substance the human body can produce, you can actually imagine what they can actually do once they come into soft tissues. We know about dental infections, right? Small ones like this or huge ones, or even the worst ones that are absolutely lethal to 50% of 
when they hit the patient. But furthermore, there's also these little buggers. This is a carcinoma that walked into my office this week. Uh, this patient was lastly seen by a dentist in December, had a recall appointment in March for checkup of a suspicious mucosa area. And uh, she didn't go to the dentist as she feared corona infection from a dentist due to bad newspaper reporting. And now as we send her, it's already a carcinoma invasive and we'll have to resect on that. This could have been prevented. So from a medical perspective, the interruption of dental work is not beneficial. There can be situations where we can seize our work for two weeks or something. But if we interrupt it for months, we have to have hard data. And from my perspective, the literature doesn't show that, not at all. Furthermore, Germany has been one of the biggest life experiments along with Sweden uh, for dentists being open in the corona pandemic. And we didn't see any issues there. So probably we are pretty safe in what we're doing. Some advertisement for the things I really like to speak about. It's augmentation and I'm happy to present that on the 20th of, of May online. Uh, so allow me to conclude what we do is sufficient. And Miguel will shortly talk about his project, Slow Dentistry probably. Here it is. Uh, which incorporates so many parts of that already in everyday good dentistry work. This is my brother and me, and I thank you for your kind attention for that long time. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, great summary of literature and from different aspects. So I think it was really so good. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question uh, now. Uh, you mentioned about actually efficient suction is quite enough for the eye results. Is there a way that uh, we can measure if our suction is uh, effective, uh, like a percentage of uh, liters that it sucks per minute? You could if you know exactly how much liters per minute your handpiece produces, right? But this is very, very different between the several brands, the cleaning situation of your handpiece, like your whole dental unit. So it's probably what you could do if you want to test in your office. Um, you apply indicator paper to a face shield and then go for the suction protocols and just see if there's any humidity coming to you. Okay, so uh, after uh, we finish this session, we will be discussing all together uh, about these topics. Uh, so Dr. Park, uh, on behalf of these scientific data, uh, I would love to hear also uh, your protocols and the procedures that you applied in uh, Mir clinics. Uh, we would love mm -hmm. to listen to you now. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to appreciate the, uh, that and uh, Dr. Kibel with me in this uh, webinar. And <clears throat> okay, let's start, okay. Mm. Yes, uh, it was uh, really painful, especially to denti uh, dental professionals uh, with the coronavirus. Just a moment. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> uh, okay. Let me talk about the disinfection protocol for dentistry after COVID-19. It was not actually, we didn't start yet in this day. As, uh, when we had a um, pandemic situation uh, for, with the coronavirus, as nobody couldn't work and the uh, government forced us to, to lock down but it's becoming better and the, the number of new patients is coming smaller and smaller. But now uh, dentistry is a starting. We have, to, uh, <clears throat> we have to make our own uh, new normal for, uh, to protect ourselves and you know, to protect our patients after, after coronavirus. I was introduced as a as a CEO, but I'm a, basically, I'm a dentist. So today I had many surgeries also. I love dentistry. So I do many, do, I do many implant surgeries and augmentations and uh, some uh, perio surgeries. This is uh, the building I'm working, working in. 
And this uh, Mir Clinic started uh, 2002, almost 20 years ago. And now we have uh, 140 people working together, including dentists and the dental staff, uh, dental hygienists and uh, lab technicians. And we have almost 400 uh, patients every day. So it was uh, uh, quite uh, very, very important to keep the space as safe as possible. Uh, following Wuhan in China, the Daegu city became one of the most uh, uh, famous city for uh, coronavirus. So among, uh, we had uh, 10, almost 10,000, a little bit more than 10,000 uh, corona patients. So among them, uh, almost 70% of patients happened in this Daegu city. So we were at the center, epidemic center of uh, coronavirus in Korea. But we didn't close uh, the, our clinic. Even the most patients uh, reluctant to come to the dentistry. Uh, and uh, the government didn't lock down the hospitals and just recommended to stay outside and uh, uh, only uh, have uh, treatments for emergency case. And they really, we really tried to be clear our space is very safe. We are doing very strict way of uh, uh, disinfections. So we, uh, even we were, we, we didn't lock down and the, the, most of the patients didn't come at the beginning. Almost uh, one, 10%, 10% of patients came into the clinic. And then now it almost recovered to 80%. So uh, already uh, Marcus explained, uh, how the coronavirus transmitted. So there are two ways, as you know, uh, direct transmission from the droplets of uh, uh, patient's saliva uh, by coughing and the sneezing. So, so it's the inhalation transmission. And there are one more, the contact transmissions. So this uh, droplet uh, stays on the surface for some days. And then when we touch the contaminants, and move to other surface, the dentist and the, or the, any patients can be transmitted. So we call this contact transmission. So uh, mask, wearing mask is uh, just essential. So uh, 19, uh, 95, 94, 95 quality, qualified the mask is uh, much better for human uh, or other people. But as a dental professional, I think uh, that this um, and the mask is, is good enough. And we have, to, the, we have to change this mask every patient or very quickly. And, uh, of course, for everybody, the <clears throat> washing hands with the soap uh, for more than 22 minutes and it's, it's essential. Okay? So I'm, I'm washing my hands more than 20 times a day. And this is uh, the biggest problem in dentistry, airborne transmission. Right? How we can avoid, how we can protect uh, ourselves from this uh, uh, aerosol. That, I think this is the, the main uh, questions we, uh, we should. So what we made the protocol, what kind of protocol we made. I'd like to skip everything, but just uh, focused on two things. So we need to know where the virus stays. As Marcus emphasized many times, so it comes mainly comes from oral and the nasal mucosa. From the contaminated the surface, the cloth and the patient's hands and the shoes can be another source of uh, uh, viruses, right? So we need to protect uh, our patients and our, our space from these possible contaminants. So uh, there are two ways. There are so many ways, but uh, basically we can uh, classify those uh, protections uh, into two ways, mechanical and chemical. So mechanical protection is uh, like personal uh, protection equipment, mask, facial shield, and gloves. That's very basic. And then, as Marco showed, we, can, we have to use a very powerful suction. But the dental suction is not it's not uh, powerful enough. So I will show you the special aerosol suction systems. 
This is not very popular at this moment, but I believe this aerosol, special aerosol suction system should be mandatory for all uh, dental offices. And the other, another way is chemical protection. And uh, when we had the corona uh, pandemic situation in Daegu City, we searched many documents, articles. So which chemicals can be effective on virus? So at the beginning, most people uh, uh, wanted to buy the uh, as a handy san hand sanitizer, mainly uh, uh, as made from the alcohol. So, but it's not so good. So we, we, uh, finally, we decided to use these two chemicals. It's povidone iodine, mouthwash, which is betadine, goggle, and the HOCL, it's in between uh, techniques. So mechanical protection, is really important. We have the uh, aerosols, so mask, and this, this is just a basic uh, tool. Thing. This is uh, photos from my friends in the United States. So uh, look at, look at uh, it's like a movie, right? So the, all the uh, dental steps had uh, goggles and uh, facial shield, mask, and uh, even uh, in plastic uh, downs. But this is very, very difficult to, to stay, to continue to stay. Right? And, and it's very difficult to breathe even. And what is the more dangerous? As so wearing this kind of a perfect costume for the treatment of patients, it's good, only one time. How we can change this, this costume every Patients. So, so my doctor friend said that so the most dangerous moment is to change the cloth. So when you uh, when they examine the, the patients and uh, when they have uh, uh, when they take rest, they have to take off the cloth and so it disinfect the whole body three times. So in dentistry, can we do that? No, it's uh, almost impossible. The simple way, I think, simple way is the best. Wearing facial shield, mask, and gloves. This is uh, the basic tools. And then, okay, okay, let's see, simple video. As you can see, mm -hmm. the dentist and hygienist are both wearing a face mask plus a full face shield. This is important protection as they are so close to the patient. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't wear the uh, single-use gowns. So normally, I, I usually, usually, mm, I wear the, the just normal gown, and then, and especially I use the uh, facial shield in this period. Okay. As you can see, okay. the dentist Sorry. and hygienist are both wearing picture. a face mask. Mm -hmm. Plus. Okay. And this is a very special uh, aerosol suction system, which was made in, in Japan. And uh, when I saw this machine uh, from my senior's office in Japan, I thought that this should be the essential. So the name of the product is RPO Arm Suctions. It was connected to the uh, very powerful main, uh, as main, as most main motor. So all the aer aerosol goes out the uh, out of the office building, okay. And we uh, now nowadays we have many different kind of machines like this. It's portable, portable extra such systems. But in this case, we have, we need to be very careful to change the filter as often as possible. Otherwise, it can circulate the uh, the virus in the office, changing the air. It's really, really important. One more safeguard is the use of an aerosol suction system. Most dental procedures produce aerosols that include very small droplets of patient saliva. Pathogens can become airborne. This special device acts like a vacuum and keeps the air clean. Pretty cool. Okay. 
그래서 또 한가지 백날리지는 이게 굉장히 파워풀해요 이게 에어가 한번 석션이 되었다가 스탑을 하면 에어가 다시 빠져내려올 텐데 그렇지 않고 그냥 다 머물러 있다 셧다운 된다는 것이 Okay, but the, the suction, suction and RPO arm is quite expensive, almost the same price with unit chip, one unit chip. And but it is, I really want to recommend to all of you to use this device. This is uh, very urgent, right? It's uh, urgent, uh, it's like urgency. So, so with our team, we made uh, one simple solution. It cannot be solution, perfect solution, but just additional applications. So we developed the uh, second RC. Second RC is a second arm, like a, a, a system. And then we developed the hopper suction systems. Okay. So, so we can, you can put the one more, it can be connected there to the right arm very easily. And then, this is a very similar way of Marcus <laughs> using the dental uh, suction system. Another way is connecting a funnel to an air suction. However, filtering the air with an external vent is always critical. Otherwise, the pathogens can keep working. Yikes. So we can say this is a, a facial shield for the patients. And then uh, there are two ways of chemical protection. So number one is COVID-19 mouse gargle. Uh, Marcus already uh, explained the the chlorhexidin, the most popular uh, mouse gargle, is not efficient for the for the virus. Uh, as far as we, we examined. Uh, 0 0.45 and the 1.1 percent uh, COVID-19 solution, cutting goggle is really uh, working on the uh, the viruses. Kill this COVID-19 can kill viruses, germs, and bacteria within 15 seconds from the articles, and it's not toxic for human. And this is an another article showing uh, the COVID-19 is. Uh, What do you mean? Okay, sorry. The video, sorry. Sorry for Korean, sorry. Sorry for my video. Video was not working, it didn't work well. Anyway, as a Povidon iodine is a really effective and very cheap and effective, effective way of uh, protecting us. So this is comparison chart uh, between uh, Corexin with an iodine and the other mouse goggles. So as you see uh, on the bottom, so uh, especially on the bureaucidal activity, correcting is fully effective. On the other end, and the povidone iodine is uh, strongly effective. And uh, the price, even the price, price is not a big issue, but price is uh, most effective. So very easy to buy from the pharmacy. But during this corona pandemic situations, this was also not easy to buy from the pharmacy, but most of uh, dental clinic has a uh, COVID-19 uh, iodine, right? ten percent mostly, ten percent COVID-19 for surface uh, on the cringing, right? So we can dilute it to make a mouse uh, spray. So only you can add two millimeter of a ten percent COVID-19 iodine solutions to forty-two millimeter of a sweetener and some menthol and waters. So only for on your own use and uh, to disinfect the mouse. And there are some drawbacks uh, of COVID-19. Uh, so you can 
it, it works almost a day uh, for a day, but uh, in this situation, it's better to spray uh, three, four times. I did four, five times per day for, my, for myself. The, the, the article recommended to limit the three times a day. And if we use uh, too many and uh, too long, and uh, it can stain uh, our teeth and tongue, and it can be uh, dangerous for the thyroid dysfunction patients and uh, other autoimmune disorder patients. So we should ask uh, medical history when, uh, uh, when you use forbidden iodine. The second uh, chemical protection way is, was hypochlorous as HOCL for spring, misting, and fogging. HOCL was not very well known uh, before this pandemic situation. We didn't use this very often, but this was uh, uh, it? Mm. proved as a very strong and very powerful and very efficient uh, disinfectant for viruses for, from 1970s. Mainly, HOCL is made from the HCL, and by hydro hydrolysis, so we can make HCL solutions. Uh, we can control the, the PPM. This is a, a chemical com compounds recommended by the Ministry of uh, Environment in Korea, and there are many uh, compounds, but as you see, the hypo uh, hypochlorous acid was on the top. How strong, how effective did the, this HOCL uh, solutions? Uh, from, the, from the start, you can see HOCL and the NaOCL is uh, are, are efficient on viruses. The others, ethanol and the cresolphenol detergent, uh, cannot kill viruses. It just, uh, NaOCL is uh, like a bridge. Uh, it's too strong and it smells and uh, sometimes it make the corrosion on the surface. It's very irritant to the skin as well. And uh, how effective PPM we have to make? So it's, it should be at least a 10 PPM virus and um, mostly recommended to use uh, from uh, 50 to 100 PPM. So over, over 50 PPM, bacteria and viruses can be killed within 30 seconds. Over 200, it can be uh, and, uh, bacteria and viruses can be killed immediately, but it smells bad and uh, sometimes it irritates our skin. And so the PPM for the, the different uses for the surface spray, 70 to 100 PPM is recommended. Misting is about 50 to 70, and fogging is almost the same. But in our clinic, we use almost the same PPM, like uh, 70 PPM. 70 PPM has almost no smell, and uh, you can use uh, as hand wash also. Some articles show that uh, it's uh, very safe and effective for mouse lens compared to the Corexidine and the other uh, Corexidine. And uh, so this is just a study. So from the from the photos, you can see the uh, hypochlorosecl, mouse goggle, uh, killed uh, much uh, efficiently viruses and the bacteria uh, in the mouth. And uh, I had uh, some questions from uh, previous webinars and uh, the doctor asked me, can we use HOCL for water system of initials? That means uh, for, the, for the water for high speed or low speed. Yeah, I think that's uh, and one of the good solutions that we need to be very careful not for the patients not to swallow this HOCL. Normally, we use HOCL to clean the water pipe for the, for the unit tears in, in the cleaning. So it's already used, but not too many, not too much. Okay? Actually, COVID-19 virus don't get transmitted through the through the waters, just cleaning the patient's mouth and the nose and the what uh, hands and the costume. That is, I think, more important than a water system. You said it's really safe if it is less than 100 ppm. It's not toxic, 
and uh, no present order, uh, no unpresent orders, and uh, it's, even it is not irritant on the skin and the uh, eyes. And under 60 ppm, when we can uh, clean, we can sanitize uh, the fruits and the vegetables. We don't need to rinse again. And uh, uh, the p p pH is very important for HOCL. So if uh, the HOCL lose the pH or it become, when it becomes very strong to two or three pH, it's not working well properly. Two uh, irritants, but not effective with the virus and the bacteria. So adequate pH from five to 6.5, similar to human skin. At this stage, it is more, most effective. It's not corrosive also, and it evaporates off from the surface, and there is no residue. And okay, this, uh, this is uh, uh, another table I made uh, for this uh, webinar. This is from the, from the questions from previous webinars. So, how about the effectiveness of uh, compared to ozone and uh, UVC and uh, uh, NaOCl? Uh, ozone, actually, ozone is, uh, is too irritant to the human being, as you know. If it can be as a density, in the air, it's not, it's not recommended. You will see it's only for the item uh, disinfections. So there's a limitation on distance. So compared to H NaOCl, it's a OCL, you can smell it, you can use it. That this is much safer and much better. The surface spray. Yeah, this I think uh, as I agree with the Marcus, and uh, we don't need to clean uh, surface every day, every moment. So, because we already cleaned our our patients' mouths, and uh, we already broke ourselves from with the uh, items. So this is to avoid uh, zero point one percent of possibility. Okay, and I made uh, that one. Comments on the bottom. If every patients get proper disinfection, infection process before the treatments, this will be necessary. So we don't need to bloom uh, very often. And uh, with uh, one of our uh, one of the Korean company uh, developed these uh, machines, very simple and very clever machines. This is to sanitize uh, the patient's costume and uh, hands and the shoes. So it can be, uh, the height can be adjustable. How we can make, uh, how we can generate uh, HOCL? Uh, there are two machines I'm using, and uh, <clears throat> one is a big one, SLP120. This is on less than one meter. It's not big, it's that much big, but it's very powerful machine to make a hundred, more than 100 liters per, per hour. So this is good for the hospitals, the, even the schools can cover, uh, can be covered with one machine. Some hundreds, sometimes a thousand people can use uh, one machine. This is a, a, a e-clean system, so it's a home use. Well, it can produce about 1.5 liters per uh, eight minutes, so in, uh, simply, so uh, 1.5 liters per hour, uh, per 10 minutes. And uh, this amount is, I think, enough for the small clinics and uh, for the restaurants. And when <clears throat> they have uh, dozens of patients yeah. a day. Or... So, well, this is really a very simple and a very um, way we uh, we tried uh, for our ourselves and uh, for, for not only for Miro Clinic, so we use the same protocol company, and fortunately, there was no uh, infected patients uh, from our hospitals and uh, from our group. So we have to protect ourselves because uh, there is no antibody and uh, it's uh, vaccines so far. I think it would be long. And at that time, when we had the vaccine, when we had the vaccine, there may be the uh, one more other viruses coming out. 
So we have to protect ourselves with some kind of uh, useful and frequental ideas. Action is the, the most important and the, the most uh, useful decisions for our uh, patients. So this can be new normal. There will be, I believe, there will be uh, some more protection tools, including uh, not only the mask and the goggles and the facial shield. Uh, I, I'm waiting the new new toys. There are so many uh, articles. Uh, if you have, a, if you want to have more uh, documents, and you can connect it with Minek at imagine.com. We have hundreds of articles, and so you can download it as we very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Park, for this informative presentation. Uh, I know you have uh, big facilities at uh, Mir Dental Clinic. So, Marcus, you mentioned that intraoral uh, suctions are actually quite effective if they are done uh, properly. So, what do you think about uh, these products, these special RSO suction systems to be used in the clinics? And also, Miguel, uh, I would also would like to have your ideas about this. I've, I've researched that as much as I could and tried to find evidence, but I couldn't find evi any evidence that it actually improves the protection over a proper forehand suction technique. I found evidence that it's a lot less efficient compared to forehand suction technique. So if you're using a good suction technique, like Professor Park showed, and maybe what, what I really liked about presentation, thank you so much, I learned a lot from you again, Professor Park, um, is that second hand that you showed, right? The, the mechanical assistant to apply the, which is basically a, a forehand suction system, right? So what we know is the, the sprays emerge from our handpiece, splash to the mucosa, and from there they, they evaporate. And that's exactly the point where we have to catch them. If we catch them somewhere over there, it doesn't make any difference for us, for our personal protection while we're working. So it's the, the forehand technique, maybe even the mechanical forehand technique is the way to go. And anything else is if you feel better with that. There's so many things out there. If it makes you personally feel better, wonderful. It doesn't harm. It definitely just doesn't harm, right? But mm -hmm. It's, it's money, it's effort, it's space. So if, if you are okay with the system you, you're using, from my perspective and from the literature that I reviewed, there's no need to extra add that on. <clears throat> well, first of all, you know, I'm, I have so much respect for everybody here. And of course, uh, Kuba, thank you for this invitation. I come as an independent citizen, not just a dentist. <clears throat> I, want, I want to bring my worldview because I'm not going to add to what Professor Park said or what Marcus said. I have given 30 webinars since the outbreak. We were the, uh, as the founder of Slow Dentistry, we were the first organization to come out with 10 commandments, which I will explain later. But I wanted to come as a, as a, as a human being, as, a, as a, an individual, a private citizen. And thinking like a private citizen, I can safely say that a great majority of dentists have been lazy, have been breaking the rules, have not been following protocol, have been finding the best way to use the cheapest systems for way too long. Cheap implants, cheap, cheap materials, cheap products. You go to the ADEC in Dubai and the, the replica hall is twice the size as the halls with the patents. Mm -hmm. I don't own any patents. I don't own any shares in any company. I'm not being paid here today to sit and talk. I'm talking like a citizen. The time has come for this madness that has been happening in dentistry to end because I see very hardworking scientists and very hardworking companies all talking about this is how we need to do things. And they come out with these ideas. Now we're going to do it like this. But then you go to the real world and what happens is you have people only for profit, only for profit. They're not trying to help anybody. They're just trying to make a little bit more money faster than anybody else using 
single hand suction when generating aerosols. For example, so we can talk till we're red in the face about the ideal solutions, but I bet you right now, the thousands and thousands and thousands, not just Turkish, but global dentists watching this are gonna say, yeah, but that's gonna cost more money. And until we get past that, until we get past that boundary, it's gonna be a very frustrating conversation. And if you're gonna put dentists, policing dentists, it's never gonna work, it never has worked, you know how I know this? We failed at convincing dentists that using a rubber dam was safe. We failed at doing that. And how do I know we failed? Because the public doesn't even know that they have the right to ask for it. And changing the conversation as a human being, there's an epidemiological study on the use of the preservative for reducing sexually transmitted diseases which is very easy to get access to, very easy to use, and it reduces the transmission of sexually transmitted disease almost entirely, and still most people don't use it. And it's very cheap. So I am very, I'm very proud to be a thought leader, and I'm very proud to sit with thought leaders, and everybody's talking, but are we talking for the 1% of dentists? 5% of dentists that actually do the right thing every day and follow the science? Because I'm getting angry. Because I see people sending chat messages and always the chat messages, yeah, but that's too expensive. Yes, but that means I have to see fewer patients a day. And somebody's got to come up and say, this is crazy. Your, your obligation as a doctor is number one, do no harm. And right now, do no harm means protect yourself, protect your patient, but also protect your team, protect the cleaning lady, protect the person doing the disinfection, the receptionist. How many clinics around the world, not just in Turkey, and trust me, I have lectured professionally in over 50 countries. I know what I'm talking about, okay? And the owner of the clinic drives a very, very expensive car and everybody else has to catch the bus home and the, the person that's answering the phone is also the disinfection is also cleaning the floor. This happens. It's a reality. And if we're not going to talk about that, then I don't want to be part of these discussions anymore. Because we have to protect dentistry, not just protect 5% of the top dentists. Because civilization deserves better. And as scientists, we've been talking about basic ethical dentistry. Professor Park knows my work, Marcus knows my work. We go on stage and we talk about amazing implant techniques and amazing cosmetics. You are the best. Galip Gorel just reposted something of mine. He's a hero to me. He's one of the best dentists on earth from Turkey, okay? You guys have high, high, high level uh, dentistry in Turkey. But if we don't start thinking about solutions, so the lowest income 30% of dentists can apply this and say, okay, it's time to stop then we're just gonna fail. So we've obviously failed in many things because most clinics, not in Korea, not in Germany, but most dental practices in the US, in the UK, in Portugal, and many countries around the world were shut down at the same time as hair salons. Marcus has proved with, with no doubt, Professor Park has proved with no doubt that if you follow the rules, you are safe. Professor Park took it to another level. Marcus didn't take it to another level. And guess what? Nobody got sick because dental clinics have always been a safe space. But what nobody's putting is the big sign, quality dentists that have always been practicing safe dentistry. And as the founder of Slow Dentistry, what do I get? I get people saying, yeah, I've been doing that all my life. And then you get other people saying privately, I can't do that because I have to see 50 patients a day because that makes me a great doctor. And I just think if we're not going to address this discussion, that volume and safety, not to mention volume and quality, is something that just doesn't exist in our profession. There's not one scientific paper on the planet that says that you have to see 50 patients a day. The only reason you do that is to make more profit. And usually, the only people making the profit is the practice owner, the business owner, and the number one team at that practice. Nobody else benefits from that mindset.
and I'm sorry, I, I'm, you know, hey, you invited me to the table and that's my honest opinion. And I know I'm right because I'm getting hundreds and thousands of messages. I haven't even been able to sleep from people saying, thank you, finally. So I know that there's a lot of rules and regulations around the world, but if we don't collectively come together as dentists and say, listen, we are the, probably the safest medical facility to go to, okay? But the good guys have to not allow the bad guys to work anymore. And for example, most insurance companies around the world cannot afford right now to keep the price and to apply the measures of safety. And we're just discussing to bring it around full circle. Aerosols are reduced exponentially if you have a second set of hands. But an oral hygiene, the cheapest of dental procedures to be done, most oral hygienists on earth work by themselves. Aerosols produced by ultrasound, it's the biggest ultrasound. Now, Marcus can say, and he's right, and the studies from uh, Eduardo Mann from Chile showing that the viral content of aerosols is reduced. But guess what? Probably reduced in a patient that doesn't have that hasn't done a cleaning in 30 years, you know? But in some countries, you know, the patients haven't had a cleaning in 30 years, you don't really know that. So all I'm trying to say is, we need to rethink how we are practicing dentistry. There has to be more regulation. We have to control the number of people in the room. And since doctors are definitely going to find a way to get around it to save money, then we have to inform the public. So I think organizations like yours have to start saying to the public, in order to be safer, make sure, I'm not saying you have to have a second pair of hands in the room always. If the same person that's your assistant is also your receptionist, call her when you're generating aerosols. That's all I'm saying. And everybody wants to be politically correct, but you know what, this virus isn't politically correct. HIV isn't politically correct. Hepatitis isn't politically correct. Legionella isn't politically correct. But you know how many clinic practices around the world actually disinfect their air, air conditioning systems before this? Uh, you know about this, Marcus, right? The, 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 the Legionella. And, and so we, a lot of dental clinics have been lazy. And I know that the good guys that have spent fortunes, fortunes, but not now, in the last 20 years, going extra measures of safety, extra investment, high quality implants, high quality everything. And then when you go and see the price that they charge versus the price of competing clinics that have half the staff, half the quality materials, and only 20% cheaper, who do you think the consumer is going to? It's going to the clinic that's offering the cheaper price. Who do you think is making more money? And if you don't look at the money, if you don't look at the economy of things, we're not going to get out of this. You know why? Because the ones that actually do want to invest in improving, they're going to have to hire more people and they're going to have to treat fewer patients. And that means they're going to have to charge more money and we're going to have to help them. We're going to have to help them. And we're going to have to protect these guys that want to go the extra mile. Otherwise, the ones that are not willing to see fewer patients and not willing to change their prices, they will not do anything about what we're talking about. And if they're not going to do anything about what we're going to talk about, what are we doing? Why have I invested and everybody here has invested all of this time? Because it has to be a collective effort. And that's pretty much, you know, that's what I wanted to say just as a, as a foundation to what we're talking about here. Exactly, Miguel. Uh, there is no way we cannot uh, be on the same line with you. Uh, and as... Marcus also mentioned actually old uh, biosafety protocols are really enough if, we, if they are done properly, if we work for hands in the convenient situations and if we do oral, section, uh, oral uh, suctions properly. And then, uh, of course, but now the new guidelines should be clear and they should be applied uh, in different uh, clinics in different types of uh, way of working uh, types, but let's talk about... I'll, sh I'll show you our 10 steps, okay? So yeah. this is actually the very first time in the world people are going to see this, and um, here we go. So uh, we came up with 10 steps to fight cross-contamination, uh, and just before we start, I'm going to put this here. If anybody wants to understand how they can download this, 
get your smartphone and photograph this QR code and it will direct you straight to the website of slowdentistry.com and you can download for free the PDF with these 10 steps, all right? They are in English. Hopefully, maybe even perhaps you can help us translate them into Turkish, all right? It's not sure. that easy. We've done this for free. We just wanna help give some guidelines. In order to be clear, our guidelines do not cost you any money. So for example, I also bought the HEPA filters like Professor Park. These things are expensive, but maybe, you know, the bottom 30% cannot afford them. And, as my, and I'm, I love the fact that we've got the two spectrums, you know? We've got what Professor Park invested in, absolutely extraordinary. I'm, I've also done that. But then you've got the poorer cautions. I got some top dentists from South Africa calling me. What about the poor dentists that can't even afford basic materials? How are they gonna protect themselves? So these guidelines should not cost you any money except for a little bit of extra time. And maybe according to some experts, $10 per patient on average. So you can adapt that, you know, five to $10 extra for a mask and a PPE and so on and so forth. So um, we've done, this is my working day. These are some of the extra measures during the COVID lockdown. I personally was doing emergencies. So we started gradually implementing. One of the biggest difficulties was actually buying them, the, uh, the availability of these. There's currently uh, the gowns that you see. So the disposable gowns, the stock is almost running out. Um, and we bought undergarments as well. So I'm going to show you the 10 steps in our video. I've lowered the music. Can you hear me talking? Yes. All right. So these are our 10 steps to fight cross-contamination in a dental practice. And I think they'll go, so avoid having too many people in common areas, avoid sophisticated furniture, remove all books, everything patients can touch, the coffee machines, everything. So um, you should also separate furniture to allow for social distancing and non-essential people should wait outside. Let me explain that. I, culturally, some, com some com countries, I don't know why, but the person who's coming needs to bring their, their cousin, their brother. I don't know why. Maybe they, they don't trust the doctor. But we need to make sure on the phone call that that screening is done. And we have to be courageous enough to say, please, only the patient comes into the building. Oh, but I want to, only the patient comes into the building. All right. Now, uh, if it's, of course, a handicapped person, a person that cannot walk, an elderly, a child, of course. Why? Because that extra patient is going to require extra measures of protection, a mask, so on and so forth. So just to be clear, we are doing all of our patient management online, all right? So we have our receptionist is all done now on the cloud. We are managing our patients via phone, via teleconference. It's very difficult to do, but we feel that we, we don't want a lot of patients coming to the clinic at any given time. So of course, regularly cleaning surfaces, uh, using products, We've, Dr. Park has spoken about that, and what we're just saying is first start from the top and then work down, you know? Um, also contactless as much as possible. So the soap dispensers, not the ones that you have to touch. You can use the ones that you use your elbow or the ones that you use your feet. Uh, these contactless ones, we bought them, we didn't have them. We invested in them, they're quite cheap. And of course they should be done regularly during toilet breaks, coffee breaks. Um, now this is something that a lot of people have forgotten that packages should be disinfected. So when the lockdown happened, we were getting packages from UPS and, you know, uh, so we get a lot of deliveries, right? So uh, delivery systems, um, what, what actually shocked me, I don't know if how this was like in Korea, Professor Park, but um, so the day of the lockdown, I went to the clinic, I was by myself in the practice wearing a mask and I was just finishing up some stuff. And I was surprised to see that all of the packages were still arriving and the delivery guys had no mask, no gloves, no hats. And these are from billion dollar companies, UPS, FedEx, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to, you know, but still today they're coming without masks and gloves. And I was like, so we don't know how that, where that package went through. 
And moreover, we don't know if what's inside was disinfected, especially from our labs, so on and so forth. So we're now wiping the outside of the box and we're disinfecting the boxes inside, all right? And those boxes will then be carried into the back uh, and into the lab areas. So if you are outsourcing your lab work, like 99% of dentists on earth, make sure that that lab work has been properly disinfected. Talk to your laboratories, make sure they are having extra precautions in disinfecting that. Of course, each room should be disinfected after being tidied up. At Slow Dentistry, we require a minimum of 10 minutes turnaround should be disinfected. Why? Because we've measured people, we've measured one person doing it. Two people, less time. One person, a little bit more, but you need time for the products to actually work if you're going to disinfect the turbine, the hand pieces, the x-rays, all of the things that we touch. It's actually quite a lot, all right? So we really definitely need to, uh, to do the best we can and comply with ever governmental or local organizations. Uh, windows should be opened uh, as much as possible. And um, we've invested in, in HEPA filters. But as I said, these filters can cost a little bit of extra money. But if you don't have a window in your practice, then you definitely should have a HEPA filter to help uh, disinfect the air. Otherwise, a window that you can open in air. And remember, if you're not allowing for a fast turnaround time, what's the point of even letting that happen? You've got to let the windows open, let the room breathe a little bit. Also, that extra 10 minutes allows you to, you know, doctors are working under stress, the assistants working under stress, the staff are under stress. If you slow down, you're going to reduce stress levels for everybody. You're going to be able to talk to the patient. So I think without a doubt, we're going to have to see fewer patients moving forward. Um, of course, the safety protection measures. We've already understood that there's a scientific aspect to this, and then there's an emotional aspect to this, and then there's a governmental obligation aspect. Dentists, we discovered yesterday, or Marcus and I on a chat, you know, in, in Texas, for example, it's obligatory for them to wear uh, 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 an N95 mask uh, all the time. Now, in some companies, in some countries, you have to have a plastic uh, visor at the reception. I think, you know, some judgment. But moving forward, once the pandemic is, you know, the numbers are going to go down, I think at least for the next three months, we have to be extra cautious. Some of it is not necessary, as Marcus has proven. And some of it is, it's, look, it's great marketing, but it's also uh, complying to local rules and regulations and just to be extra safe, like Professor Park was saying. So we are doing everything. And hopefully we can downgrade, as the Americans would say, from DEFCON 5 down to DEFCON 1 in a, a, a few weeks. We have a separate area. We had seven treatment rooms. One treatment room now doesn't see patients for two reasons. One, that's where our team goes in to disinfect because it's a medical room. Notice that everything is being cleaned from there. So it's been removed, all of the stuff, all of the contaminants. And that's where the staff goes in to change. Also, in the case that we have a patient that presents symptoms or somebody on my team presents symptoms, we can instantly put them in that room, shut the door, open the windows, and then figure out, you know, clear the building and get that person to safety or to a hospital or where they need to be in quarantine so that they couldn't disinfect, uh, infect the rest of the room. Moreover, we are now having two teams. We have a morning team that comes in from 9 to 1 p.m. and a second afternoon team that starts at 2 and finishes at 8. These two teams never meet. They never meet physically, they don't meet socially, and they don't meet at the clinic, all right? And the, uh, the hygiene team never meets any of the other ones, and the lab team never meets the doctors. Thankfully, we use a lot of digital technology, so a lot of things can be done remotely, but I think that's something important. So if one of the team gets sick, they don't pass, and you can still at least run at half gas with the second team. We also make sure that our patients have this protective gear as well when they are circulating throughout the practice, uh, and we allow them to take that protective equipment home. We don't ask them to leave it behind. We say, just leave the building with it, and then, you know, uh, it's, we don't want that to stay in the clinic. 
like that, they have to dispose of it. And it's just an extra measure of safety. Also, disinfect your personal items, your phone, your earbuds uh, throughout the day. Now, these are a few measures that us at Slow Dentistry figured would be interesting to do. Uh, some are optional, some are not, but we are asking patients to shower before to come to the dentist, to not wear too much jewelry, to not wear any elaborate clothing. We, uh, in some countries you can, some countries you can't, but we suggest that you measure the body temperature. We all suggest that if somebody's got a cough or not feeling well, we can refuse treatment. And if you feel comfortable enough, definitely don't be scared to ask for a COVID um, um, test before treatment. But here's a question. I know that any one of us here, doctors, if a patient comes to our clinic and they've just fallen down the stairs, knocked out their two front centrals, the cortical bone is intact and they're bleeding and they're 26 years old and they're in front of us and they have a slight fever, I know Marcus is not going to refuse treatment and I know for certain Professor Park is not going to refuse treatment and I'm not going to refuse treatment. I'm sure you too, Kuba. Why? Because we're dentists. We understand the risks of our profession. We've understood it since the HIV pandemic. We've understood it. And I've always treated my patients as if they're infectious, always. So I'm not going to stop treating patients because they might have COVID. What I am going to do is act with safety precautions and, uh, uh, as established, but we've always been doing that. So the only thing I hope is that dentists watching this can understand that you can still practice. You don't have to be scared. You just have to probably see fewer patients, extra precautions, and maybe you'll make less money, but you'll be safer and you'll be safer than your competition. And maybe that's just the way moving forward. And uh, last but not least, we're going through. Our patients are respectfully asked to put on all of this protective gear, to wash their hands. They, there's a hand sanitizer for them. We've now gone to one contactless. So our patients definitely get fully equipped before going into the clean uh, uh, areas. So that's a patient coming for treatment. And of course, before any treatment, following what everybody else is doing, we're doing the hydrogen peroxide. And then after that, uh, the chlorohexidine. Uh, iodine is a great thing, but make sure your patients are not, oops, sorry about that. Make sure your patients are not um, in, um, allergic to iodine because as we know, there's uh, people that, my wife, for example, she's uh, intolerant to iodine. And I think there's also a difference between rinsing and gargling. And we know that the infection is mostly in the throat and that's why the spray might be a better solution, but make sure they gargle as well so they can get it into the back of their throats. Um, also, of course, the, the extra measures of protection that we've always been. And doctors should not work alone. Rubber dams should be used uh, always when possible. We know that uh, there's some studies showing that the rubber dam can exponentiate aerosols, but if you have an extra pair of hands, then you're, as we've just discussed, the aerosol generation is reduced exponentially. Also, simplified payment methods, contactless payment uh, is something that uh, we provide. So uh, patients are now paying uh, online. Um, sorry, just relieve that. Have I stopped sharing the screen? Yes. All right. So patients uh, should also be asked to pay previously to the appointments. So if you're coming to the dentist, and this is something good for us because I know a lot of dentists have a problem with patients not paying after their treatment. So we're at war right now. We have to protect our business, ourselves, our patient. And we've always, you know, patients pay after their appointment. But now during the COVID for our emergencies, we've been asking patients to pay prior. We haven't had any issues with that. And in, if, if somebody can't, then we have contactless payment methods set up. We ask them to prepare that at home so they can have, uh, a, um, you know, on their smartphone, something that can be done um, in case there's any extras. Because the last thing we've done to somebody coming for an emergency, us going through all of this, they say, yeah, I'll pay you later, and then they don't pay. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think we should be uh, worried about making sure that we get paid uh, previously for our treatments and asking them to set up contactless payments. 
So these are just a little extra guidelines. I think they're in tune with prof what Professor Park was saying, what Marcus was saying. Hopefully, this is not what our clinic will look like in six months or a year, but at least until things calm down, we're gonna have to put on these extra precaution measures. Some are for show, some are scientifically backed, but um, you know, without everybody, the, 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 let's say the, the, the top 30% of performing dentists that have been going for the cheapest of everything. Now, I know a lot of people get offended when I say this because the people, low income families need access to dentistry. If somebody, you know, if somebody has, they're, they're poor, they, they don't have money to put food on the table and they've got a toothache, these people also need care. Of course they need care. Dentistry should not be just for rich people and for high income people. But at the end of the day, safety, safety should never ever be put on the table for discussion. And quite frankly, for the last 30, 40 years it has. We know no one is using the rubber dam on root canal procedures around the world. Why? To save time. And if we lost that battle, we are definitely going to lose this one. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Um, I have some questions for you. Uh, how about the informed consent? And also, Marcus and Dr. Park, Professor Park, if you can make comments on this, uh, on getting you know, treatment during this COVID-19 period, do you, did you change some questions or did you make some changes on your informed consent? Probably we don't do any paperwork anymore. Uh, we sent these informed consents uh, online to our patients. Uh, and how is your procedures about this? So we do, we do this normal procedure as a, a government recommended. And uh, so we have uh, patients uh, history for tour tourism and uh, fevers and the check papers and so it was recommended that for us to get all kind, all kind of information but we cannot trust mm -hmm. just that they report to us but we don't know is true or not but the, the others mm, so the, the currently recommend, recommended protocol is not reliable i think the temperature, even the temperature checking, is not is not important. Only twenty percent of uh, uh, infected patients can show uh, higher temperature. So only eighty percent they don't have a symptom. So for this symptom, these patients is uh, symptom. These patients are problems for us. And uh, <clears throat> so in Korea, I believe we had uh, less than 10, 10 new patients every day nowadays, but Suddenly, one young guy went to the club in Seoul and he infected more than 40 people in a day. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. And uh, our schools starting, uh, is, is going to open from next week. So, so most people are very worried about uh, the new pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. Protection. As uh, Miguel told us, and uh, we cannot trust the, the guideline. The best way is to keep ourselves with the mechanical and the chemical way. So I think that's the best way. Mechanical way is the easiest way. Right? Yes, everybody can understand. So how many times we can block and how we can wash. Unbelievably, so alcohol is not working on virus. So how many times you wash your hands with with the, the gels, alcohol gel? It's useless. Okay. So how about you, you Miguel? How is your uh, situation about these informed consents? Any new things? Well, I'm being fanatical for twenty years, and those people that know my work to the point of losing patients. And if anybody knows my no half smiles philosophy. I would rather lose a patient for the right reasons than for the wrong reasons. So I've made myself, you know, highly protective to the point of being a fanatic because I would rather not make money than have any risk whatsoever. So this came from, you know, I was classically trained as an implant surgeon in the late 90s. 
And when you understand science and you understand biology and you understand you know, the principles of placing a dental implant and you understand the principles of prosthodontics and you understand the basics of restorative dentistry and the rules and the guidelines, then when you're doing an, incent, an, an informed consent, it's not just to protect the legal aspects of your practice, but it's actually to protect the patient. To protect the patient. Why? For example, did you know that if, you know, all the things that can go wrong in implant dentistry, all the things that can go wrong in prosthodontics, all the things that can go wrong in restorative dentistry, we have to tell that to our patients. And I, I see that dentists for so many years have been selling merchandising, you know, easy things to sell and patients are buying it. And there's been very little in real informed consent, because if there was more informed consent, I think fewer people would be doing a lot of these things and they would have more questions to ask. So I think a lot of informed consents are designed to sell an informed consent. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? Uh, my implant can fail. What do you mean my, you know, I can have occlusal issues. Do you understand? And good dentists, when they inform their patients, scare more patients away than, than a set. I know that's with, with Marcus and I know with Professor Park and I, I'm, I'm sure with you, Kubel is the same, you know? And um, I just got a message from Galip and he's watching, you know, again, thank you, my brother. You're, you're, you're been a, an inspiration to me and most you know, one of the founding fathers of minimally invasive dentistry. And the world needs to thank you because thanks to your principles, less healthy enamel is, guided, is ground off. But in order to do, and you know, later Christian Coachman with his minimal invasive, you know, the DSD designs, the whole world has gone to minimal invasiveness. You know, Professor Park with his surgical guides, all of that, minimal, minimal invasive, protecting bone. Now, if you start... I'm sorry about my long answer, but I'm getting somewhere with this. If you really want to protect your patients and you're really doing an informed consent, which is what we've all been doing, you know, that's a long conversation. It's not a standardized A4 paper that you can just sign. It's a conversation you have with a human being, not with the intent to make money, but with the intent to protect your patient. Because better than a failed implant so you can make a thousand dollars have nothing placed have a healthy bone with no infection and nothing placed no implant and i just think that we've been so committed to making profit that we've forgotten to do no harm so i haven't changed anything on my consent form and i'm happy to share it with you and your organization why because we've been doing it forever and maybe there's a reason guys like us get to talk on stage. I know it isn't because, you know, of being nice. We, we, we've been doing this consistently, consistently for decades, you know? And I, I think we've probably been inspiring dentists for the wrong reasons. Maybe because we have a nice jacket or a nice watch or, you know, we look famous and hey, it's cool. But there's a price to pay for that. And that's been ethics. Ethics. You don't stay on stage for 20 years if you're not ethical. Galip doesn't stay on stage and doesn't have the global recognition for being non-ethical. And it's a lot harder and more expensive to be ethical than not. And I just think that we need to really reevaluate what an informed consent means. It's one of the founding four. We only have four principles at Slow Dentistry. One of them is an informed consent. And it should also talk about the costs, you know? And so many doctors hide little costs down the line because it's gonna add to, maybe my patient cannot afford this and I'm going to lose them. So I would, all I can ask your amazing organization today is don't be scared of losing patients for the right reasons. Be scared of losing patients for the wrong reasons, which is, Bring in everybody in the clinic, working fast, doing stuff, and then having stress down the line. And that's all I'd like to say to that. 
Okay, actually, this is what I was trying to mention because we have our patients' emotional aspects and, of course, their perception after COVID-19 about our clinics being safe to places. It's not only from the patient's uh, perspective, also our staff. We need to have time to educate them about these new clinical uh, guidelines and uh, if we all as a team have to do everything uh, properly as uh, it should be that's what actually i wanted to mention because really i think in this time period patients need our uh, explanation to them what changes or what we do uh, in our clinics to make it uh, a safer place for them Kuba, let, let me I know about you, I know your incredible talent and how hardworking you are and how passionate you are about this. But in this one period in time, in our profession that we love, this is not the time to talk about Formula One. In, in, in Turkey, you have Formula One. And it's not the time to talk about Formula One. It's the time to talk about how we clean the floor of where we put, where we put the car. Do you understand? It's about, it's about the most basic things. And I just think that it's such an extra, we all gonna go back to talk about implants and adhesive. We're all gonna do that. Hopefully I will see you all on stage somewhere around the world very, very soon and do what we love doing. But we've all got so wrapped up in, in I don't think that, that what you just said should even be an issue, Kuba, but it is, and I, I it understand. It's like, oh, we're going to have to start doing what we should have done always. We're actually going to have to wash our hands and wear a mask and talk to our patients and, and be a safe space. Hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? So anybody watching this really, you know, thank God it's a zoom. Don't worry. You're at home. You're all by yourself. Nobody's watching your reactions. All right. <laughs> but you have to change. <laughs> Dentists have to change. The bad dentist have to stop being bad and have to stop being greedy and have to start making less profit. Otherwise, you're not gonna survive. You're not gonna survive. The good guys that have always been doing this, their patients are gonna start thinking, ah, you know what, my dentist has always been pretty clean, always been pretty safe. They're gonna know this because they learned this at the supermarket. They learned this at the pharmacy. They learned this while, while the COVID lockdown was happening. They saw it happening. And now they're going to say, uh, my, my dentist just called me. He's back open for business. But that guy was always late. He was always rushing. He, he, uh, he was cheap. He was good. Never hurt me. But his waiting room was always full. Maybe I should look for a safer dentist. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and I think that that's the only thing people need to be discussing right now. You know, if you weren't doing it, you better act very, very fast and making your patients understand that you've become a safer clinic. Okay, thank you. Okay, Marcus, is there anything you wanna to add to this topic? Miguel covered it greatly. I, I mean, informed consent is for me as for Miguel a basis to form a trust point with the patient. I inform them very, very severely beforehand. And I tell them, uh, I'll illustrate the consequences of what I'm doing, both financially and uh, from, the, uh, from the complication possibilities, even harder than reality is usually. I prepare them for the worst so to start off with. And I tell them, because my strategy is I want you to know I know my job and you can only tell that I know my job when I can demonstrate to you that there is bad things gonna happen or possible and I'm the one who is able to deal with them. So our consent forms by themselves don't have to be altered. What has to be implemented is, and we learned that from Southeast Asia, is that we do a little form of triage when the patient enters the office, right? We, we have a quick question. Hi, do you feel healthy? Have you been healthy for the last 14 days? And we document that, that's it. And with this, we demonstrate concern, but we also uh, keep our staff safe, right? And we also, this, this crisis has so many aspects and Churchill once said, never waste a good crisis. And this aligns with everything Miguel just pointed out. 
let's use this crisis to get dentistry to the point where it should have been the last 20 years already. The top-notch dentists, you, EDAT, everything EDAT stands for is basically, well, if you have followed EDAT, you're safe anyway. If you are a follower of slow dentistry, you're, you're safe anyway, nothing to change. And if you haven't yet, then try to achieve the standards those high-level organizations and high-level ideologies demonstrate. Be safe. And this, all these factors that we combine, cross-infection control, emotional control of our patients, emotional control of our staff, and emotional control of ourselves. Because allow me to be very honest here, I fear COVID-19. I don't want to get that disease. Why? I'm in the crisis groups of our area here. We have faced more than 600 cases in our little community. We had several dead, several dead without any risk factors. This is a definitely a thing I don't want to catch, right? But I go into my office every day. The same as Miguel just mentioned for HIV and, uh, and hepatitis C. I've injured myself several times on active HIV and hepatitis C patients. I've gone through the post-op medication and I've suffered badly. And every time, both physically and mentally. And you know what? I go back into my office the next morning and I'm aware of that risk. Dentistry is not a safe profession. If you want to be safe, you take a profession where you can sit behind a desk and then you will probably slip in the kitchen and break your neck. So there is nothing like safety. Life ends with death everywhere, right? We have a duty to fulfill. We're not selling cars. We are medical professionals. We are healthcare providers. This is about as high as it can come to ethics and workload in your life. And we all were aware of this before we chose that profession. And those who were not aware of that, they learned it the hard way properly. So just try to be good. And Miguel, you were one of the first I went for an interview with in this crisis. And we came to an amazing conclusion. And I keep mentioning that everywhere, good dentistry is not the most profitable dentistry. If you are a good dentist and you practice on a high level, you will earn less money than those bastards around the corner who just take care for their own pocket all the time. And you know what? I'm happy go walking home, not owning three Porsches. I don't own one actually. And I'm abso absolutely happy with that. Okay, I think this was a great uh, conclusion, Marcus. Uh, and as far as I saw, most of the questions are uh, answered. Uh, I would assume uh, uh, appreciate uh, you all. I really appreciate all your ideas and uh, these topics that we uh, covered here. Uh, so um, I think we can uh, finish the panel and of course we will be sharing uh, this through YouTube and uh, also I will ask for your presentations that we'll be sending to our attendees. Okay, thank you very much. Bye Thanks bye. for having us. Thank you, bye bye. Be safe. Thank you so bye. much. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye.